Okay, so I'm going to segue into a brief discussion about groundwater uh, seepage and fluid pathways. This is actually, um, you might have seen this on Amy's presentation on ABIQ. This is a close in zoom of a groundwater contour map we made for the project. And you can see uh, overlaid some of our um, active seeps at the dam. The dam of my nightmares. Okay, so some learning objectives. We're going to look at um, potential sources of seepage and water at a dam or a levee. Um, we're going to uh, talk about um, identifying data sources uh, for regional and local groundwater information, as well as um, pick up our Blakely Mountain case history and finish out uh, that saga. A uh, quick introduction, I'm sorry, outline. I will not talk about it. Um, but, but similar to instrumentation, this isn't intended to be an in-depth uh, discussion of groundwater. I think everybody in the room, whether you're an uh, engineer or geologist, most likely took a groundwater course in college and have probably dealt with it in your professional lives as well. Um, but it's um, really, we're just gonna discuss how teams can go about determining the source of seepage and leakage observed at projects. Um, it tends to be more of an issue at dams. I think it's pretty obvious at a levee where the water's coming from. Um, so more of a focus on dams. Um, we'll talk uh, again about data in investigations and finish up with Blakely Mountain. So introduction here, uh, this is part of what each risk assessment team needs to ask as they begin to develop an understanding of the project. I do a lot of reviews of our uh, periodic assessment reports, those are semi-quantitative risk assessments, as well as our quantitative IESs, and I'm always um, amazed at uh, how teams are challenged to explain this. Where is the water coming from? Um, so how much uh, effort the team ultimately dedicates to answering this question will depend on whether or not the project has had a history of seepage um, and related to adverse performance. I, do, I would argue you should always know how water is moving around your structure irrespective of adverse performance. Um, the team should always consider uh, this as part of their site characterization efforts. Um, even if there has been no observed seepage or adverse performance, it's important um, that those background information to help the story and make the case for the project risk. So how is the water moving through and around the structure? What influence does the reservoir have over water movement? And are there other sources that are influencing this? Uh, a lot of times it can be pretty straightforward or it can actually be pretty complex uh, depending on how many potential inputs of uh, seepage you might have. So piezometers, uh, wells, uh, flumes and weirs and seeps can be useful in understanding seepage, um, stating the obvious, and also um, those instruments can be leveraged uh, to collect water samples for chemical analyses and to conduct dye testing if that's an option. So a quick overview of your, your friend, the hydrologic cycle. We live it, we breathe it, it's our life. It's making a lot of messes these days. Um, so this is an image clip from the USGS. Um, so movement of groundwater um, is just a small integral part of the uh, integral component of a large and complex uh, system. Um, and there's an equally uh, a potentially complex interaction at dams where regional groundwater interacts with surface or river and reservoir water. Um, and the influence of local precipitation can further complicate interpretation of seepage as it will mix with those sources. Um, and I wanted to make a joke, but it might be on the next slide. Remember in uh, Todd's presentation when he was talking about angry water and he had the mad water drop? This is happy water. It's not mad yet. Yet. It'll get, it gets angrier, unfortunately. Um, but as on a regional scale, um, understanding how your project fix, fits into that regional and large scale hydrologic cycle is important. First step in characterizing the site. Um, as a team, ask yourselves this question. Other than the reservoir or the river loading, the foundation and structure, what other sources or inputs can you identify? Then uh, there's some general sources listed here that we'll talk about a little more on, on subsequent slides. So regional groundwater, um, I'll just define a couple basic terms. Um, these are two examples of what a large scale regional approach to groundwater looks like. On the right shows the Colorado Plateau Aquifer outlined in black. Um, with a study area shown in green. So that's right here, Colorado Plateau and the study areas in this, in this zone. And uh, your project might be um, within this larger area and could benefit by researching available data to start understanding how your project fits into this regional context. Um, and on the lower left is showing extent of glacial aquifers at an even larger scale. So you can see that everything kind of highlighted here in yellow um, are considered 
and a very large scale um, related to um, glacial uh, overburden. Localized groundwater, um, this is, uh, is much smaller in scale, obviously, and it can be um, influenced by local inputs and withdrawals. So this is an example of a creek flowing into a cave or infiltrating into the local groundwater system. And it could be considered an example of a more uh, localized groundwater input. Uh, this kind of information may be available in published reports. Often uh, times, though, these localized and highly site-specific features are mentioned only briefly in reports or not at all. Uh, depending on the state of the project-specific documentation, you may have some information on local seeps and springs identified in the area prior to and during construction. Um, knowing how the area around your project appeared with regards to seepage prior to construction is key to helping decipher what is causing it and, and causing it to behave the way that it is uh, during normal operations and during flood operations. So that's another question that you hear a lot out of me. Uh, looking at uh, reviewing risk assessment reports and also working with um, as an advisor with teams is um, that's all good and well what was going on pre-construction because you need to understand that. So those are happy there's our happy water yay coming down is snow coming down is dew um, anyways happy water to Todd's angry it's not angry yet. Uh, so pre precipitation can influence both regional and localized groundwater, uh, stating the obvious. While this, can be precip this precipitation can be in different forms, rain is the most efficient way to introduce water into the subsurface. Um, the point here is snow will eventually make it into the subsurface when it melts. Uh, but this could occur many months after the snow is accumulated during a storm. It's important for the risk assessment team to develop an understanding of how rain events might influence the project site and if precipitation has any influence on project instrumentation, including observation wells, pisometers, flumes, and weirs. Uh, barometric pressure can also influence groundwater levels on a small scale and should be considered when you're automating a project, automating um, your instrumentation using pressure transducers. Uh, changes in barometric pressure happen in tandem with rain that produces storms. Uh, when we were working on Abiquiu Dam, we, did a, uh, we had a really bad rockfall problem on the downstream left abutment. And um, we actually uh, scaled the bent, we benched and scaled the slope back using blasting. And we put, um, we hadn't fully automated yet, we put transducers in the embankment pisometers to monitor during construction. And it was, we didn't have the barometric pressure um, correction. So it was interesting to see, you get these big storms rolling through northern New Mexico, and you could see very clearly um, when those storms rolled through on that instrumentation data. So other, store, uh, so, so other sources. Um, expect the unexpected. So you really got to think out of the box sometimes when you're trying to understand what's going on at your projects. If your team is struggling to explain increases in instrument response, do a survey of other potential sources of water. So this actually happened um, at Abiquiu Dam. Uh, go figure. Um, and that, as Amy mentioned yesterday, it's fractured. It's, it's uh, founded on fractured rock. Um, so we had a piezometer tipped um, in the fractured rock um, that was actually, um, it began to increase in water level and the water level was much higher than the reservoir. This was upstream of the numerous grout curtains that we put in. Um, the project is located in the arid southwest and the increasing piezometer, inform it, was, it was a bit of a mystery. It doesn't rain that much there. It's actually quite dry, it's the desert. Um, upon a site visit to the project, completely unrelated, um, we realized that the maintenance staff had just upgraded the um, landscaping in front of the visitor center where this piezometer was uh, seated. And that included a drip system. And that was possibly the likely source for the water. But then several years later, we um, were out there and we found out that the water supply pipe to the visitor center had failed. Um, and actually, um, it was discovered that to be old and leaking. Um, so we actually uh, updated our hypothesis and said, I think the water that was infiltrating into P10, I think is what it was, funny what you remember, um, was considered a likely contributor um, to that not so mysterious piezometer increase. So keep that kind of stuff in mind. It could be uh, leaking utility lines or irrigation systems. So just a quick note on permeability. Um, as you all know, it's the property of soil uh, and rocks that is an indication of its ability to move fluids, whether it be gas or liquid, but we're worried about the fluids, obviously, liquid, um, to flow through the soil and the rock. So soils have a wide range of permeabilities, 
and they can be uh, either uniform or highly variable, depending on how they came to be at that location. Is it weathered residuum? Is it alluvial, fluvial deposition, placed fill, so on. Um, rock can also have a wide, a wide range of permeabilities. Um, it's typically uh, described as having a primary permeability, which means that the intact, uh, which is talking about the intact, not fractured rock. Water moving through pore spaces in the sandstone, for example, porosity. Secondary permeability is a way to describe any secondary defects uh, in the rock structure, rock, ah, rocks such as fractures, faults, and defects such as karst. Um, understanding the permeability of the foundation materials and the engineered structure is critical in developing your site characterization and understanding what capacity these materials have to move water. So structures are also something that you need to consider. So understanding the structure of the rock foundation is important as they can serve as a flow inhibitor or a flow conveyor uh, and or concentrator. Uh, this could include folds, faults, and shear zones, fractures, paleo channels, something that Amy didn't have time to touch on in the ABIQ case history um, is that on that left abutment, um, the contacts between um, the upper sandstone and that underlying mudstone had a long period of erosion and there were very deep paleo channels that were incised into that mudstone sandstone contact and we didn't find it until we were lucky enough to plunk a hole and install a piezometer right where the deepest part of that paleo channel was it was 40 feet deep and as we learned it was a huge conveyor belt of moving water from upstream to downstream in addition to the highly fractured rock the plan map here um, shown at the bottom was developed in an early phase of the ABIQ risk assessment. This here, I was trying to figure out where some water was coming from. Uh, I was trying to understand the relationship between mapped regional faults and a seep identified during construction uh, that persisted and showed reaction to changes in reservoir. So that's um, the seep was actually um, observed during the outlet works, which is, uh, you know, down below. Um, and we had this persistent seep. Um, it was quite worrisome at the time. We believe now that we know more that that's where that paleo channel was actually exiting as well. So just some notes on available data. Um, harping on this all week, but you should use all available data and information to characterize the groundwater at the project site. This should include any available inspection reports, including flood inspection reports. Teams should also uh, take note of references to seeps and springs, as I mentioned, during design and construction, as well as from inspection reports. When reviewing flood inspection reports, take note of the lake elevation um, or river stage, as well as any information regarding precipitation and tailwater conditions. This is all part of the same system. Uh, teams should also make use of any testing performed on the pre and post construction foundation, including but not limited to falling head tests, slug tests, packer testing, and pump tests. Uh, the designers of these large dams in the USA's portfolio took a lot of care and they did pretty thorough investigations and all that data is compiled somewhere. You should utilize it if you can track it down. So a little bit about monitoring, um, kind of segueing from what we were talking about on the instrumentation presentation, the risk assessment, uh, risk, risk assessment team should perform a thorough review of all available project instrumentation. This coupled with observations of seepage during normal and flood operations can serve as a basis of developing an understanding of how water is moving through and around your structure. Um, the team also needs to consider any engineered seepage reduction features such as grout curtains, horizontal drains, seepage adits, relief wells, tow drains, internal drainage features of the dam. Um, so you've got impervious core, a vertical and horizontal drains within the structure itself. Uh, ways to utilize existing data. I'm a fan of just starting to overlay things on plan and profile and sections and see if any patterns come out, um, but that's just one way to approach it. So there's a lot of ways to present um, existing groundwater and seepage data to support your risk assessment. Like with all site characterization, um, we do. Um, large complicated projects can have a lot of data to sort through. So start with the easiest information and start peeling back the onion layers is like what I like to say. So in this example shown, Project piezometer data on the record pool is shown um, on this 2D contour map. This is ABIQ again here. Uh, location of one of the pre-construction seeps is shown in green, which is, where is that at? Yeah, I'm kind of covering it with my, my thing. I should probably fix that. Um, and observed seepage is shown in red. Um, this contour map had multiple versions, as Amy can attest to. Um, 
and was updated as more information was collected and the kind of as the team's thinking evolved our documentation and site characterization products uh, evolved. So the section shown was cut at the main valley section through the dam. Um, you can see elevated phreatic surface from the drain pisometers. Amy pointed this out yesterday. Um, so we would expect if things were working properly and perhaps had been designed properly that we would not see an elevated um, piezometric surface here. Um, so what could be contributing to the elevated phreatic surface? Was this the best place to cut a section to determine uh, what effect seepage from the abutment has on drain performance? And I confess that when we uh, rejiggered the agenda, I was presenting this before ABIQ uh, was presented, so we probably need to fix that too. Um, so oftentimes, a lot of work behind the scene occurs, um, as such as determining functionality and re reliability for your instruments. This work can confirm what the instrument is sensing and whether the instruments respond to an increase in pool. Well, this work is, should absolutely be documented and presented in the risk assessment report. That hard work and hand wringing may not convey on the final site characterization products. Um, that's the point I made about you're going to work a couple of years on something and have two slides to explain it to your senior leadership. In the case of the example shown here, um, many hours and dollars were expended to verify piezometer functionality before we even started the risk assessment. So that was something I was doing in the district as the dam safety program manager. Um, and that's not showing up in that map. You just assume like, wow, you guys had a really good handle on it. Oh no, about a half a million dollars spent trying to verify that we had what we thought we had. A lot of this behind the scenes work helps uh, to reduce uncertainty and improve the team's confidence in the risk assessment results. Uh, investigations and adding monitoring. This is a picture at Trinidad Dam in southeastern Colorado. Um, all of our instrumentation failed. Every single piezometer was sheared. We only had one inclinometer on the project. It was uh, quite uh, interesting. It went through an IES as well, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, as the team becomes more familiar um, with project data and has also begun working through the PFMA and SQRA, data gaps and uncertainties should be documented. These verified data gaps and uncertainties will cover more than just site characterization. Um, they will also likely span multiple disciplines, as we've, as we've talked about this week, and feed the risk assessment in different ways, uh, specific to groundwater and seepage, and provided the project has the budget to do so, a team should consider developing an investigation plan to add monitoring. Um, depending on the instrumentation to be added, there may be an opportunity to collect additional soil and rock information. Uh, as part of the drilling and instrument completion process. Uh, the picture shown uh, here is a recent investigation, as I mentioned, this was actually 2015, so not so recent. Um, performed at an embankment dam um, that had confirmed failed instruments. Sonic drilling was utilized. Uh, we used the Savannah District Sonic Rig and the piezometer and inclinometers were replaced and added back into the project. Embankment samples uh, were collected and analyzed excuse me, for mechanical properties, this data was incorporated with existing project data and included in our slope stability analysis. So when we started to understand the failure of our instruments, we grew concerned, and perhaps wrongly so at the time, that we could have um, a defect in the structure um, that could fail. Um, what we determined ultimately was that it was um, drag on the pipes as the dam settled over time. It actually was kinking and failing the instruments. Um, so we've got inclinometers in there now, and I still talk to my peeps in Albuquerque, and they tell me that everything's looking good, so glad to hear it. Other investigations. Um, so there are many other ways to improve our understanding and have confidence in how groundwater and seepage is moving through and around the project. Uh, it's not meant to be a fully comprehensive list, uh, but certainly a list of common field tests, inexpensive field tests that can be performed. Uh, falling head and slug tests can be performed on existing instruments and help inform permeability of the materials in the vicinity of the sensing zone. Um, they can also be conducted on newly installed instruments. Uh, pumping tests can help understand larger scale permeabilities over a large site using existing or new instruments to help inform how water is moving. Whoops, that was too far, sorry. Um, do, 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 do. In response to pumping from one point, I worked at a project in Seattle District, Howard Hansen Dam, and we're, um, it was part of this fish passage facility um, that is still ongoing after 23 years. We, we, we may be slow, but we're expensive. But at any rate, we were concerned about seepage through the rock mass. It was highly fractured, highly deformed um, uh, volcanic rock. 
and we drilled and installed a pumping well on one side of the spillway uh, tainter gate, gate structure and then we had drilled a bunch of core holes to get collect data to design the fish passage facility and we and we dropped transducers down all of them and we did like a 24-hour pump test it was a lot of fun because i was like a gs7 and i didn't know what was going on um, but what we discovered was um, depending on where those transducers were set, we had a significant faulted structure um, between that pumping well and a number of those instrumented core holes that did not respond to the pumping test. And we knew that we saw that structure on the mapping and the information we had from construction, but that verified that that was a retarding structure. It was not moving water upstream to downstream. So a lot of nifty things you can do. Dye testing is intended to pressure, uh, um, it, to measure the presence of injected dye to determine flow path and flow rate of seepage. Aqueous geochemistry can help understand, help you understand what sources are contributing to your observed um, seepage and leakage. And, and with every test listed here, utilizing these tests and investigations will depend on budget and schedule. So, you know, we talk about all these really cool projects that we get to do, but all of us in your instructor pool will acknowledge that we don't always have all the money in the world or the time to do it. Um, we're fortunate to work on our large risk assessments because we have more bandwidth on those. So ideally, as a team, you want to utilize multiple tools uh, to help inform the groundwater seepage model. Um, and ultimately, the failure modes driving the risk uh, for your project. If your risk driver is overtopping, efforts to understand stating the obvious groundwater and seepage um, should be limited. Uh, that's not what you would be looking at necessarily. So you only want to execute additional work where seepage uh, related failure modes are driving the risk. Um, in other words, you may have some seepage related failure modes that have been excluded as a risk driver and you'll need to support the exclusion of these from um, further consideration in your report. But it would be difficult, if not impossible, to make the case to decision makers to conduct additional investigations. We were doing an interim briefing to an external um, review panel for ABIQ Dam. And I really was trying to go down the rabbit hole of that one seep that was there pre-construction. And if I could just get one more round of geochem sampling, I could figure it out. And our director looked at me without blinking and said, I'm not paying you to do a science experiment. And I was like, okay, noted. Geologist in me gets ahead of myself sometimes. But that was a fair statement. That wasn't driving the risk. There was no reason to invest another dollar in it, even if it was a minor cost. All right. Take a breath. Pick up Blakely Mountain. All right. So where we ended the last presentation, um, we had some successful research at the Vicksburg District, as well as the National Archives. Um, we found installation details um, for our project pisometers, but not complete. We also discussed the results of our downhole camera survey. Um, as stated here, the team scoped a non-invasive field investigation in the hopes to better understand a pisometer that started behaving differently um, after a flushing operation. The work described here was in support of that previously identified concentrated leak erosion failure mode uh, for our fully quantitative risk assessment. So um, in May of 2018, uh, we performed our first round of aqueous geochemistry sampling. Um, so this is a plan map. Um, of the dam showing the location of our pisometers and manholes, and those are highlighted in yellow. Um, and we also had some manholes um, in that um, seepage collection system that they uh, constructed. So what we did is we, I uh, worked with a chemist that I knew in Albuquerque District, um, and then his partner in crime, uh, an environmental engineer in Fort Worth District actually, um, helped us um, scope um, and execute the sampling um, schema. So by sampling and analyzing the water chemistry, the team was trying to answer the following questions. Is the water in the pisometer seeping through a crack in the embankment directly influenced by the reservoir or is water coming from the foundation? Um, could it have been influenced by regional groundwater? So that was kind of our original question that we were asking. Uh, so this is an overall um, view of the project. Um, so it's a larger scale plan view. Um, you we were very lucky. So there was some luck in here. I'd like to say a hunch, but maybe some luck. Um, so we did have um, the good fortune of having uh, two uh, functional um, water wells, water supply wells in the area that we could sample. Um, that would help us kind of, what you want to do is you want to characterize 
what the regional groundwater signature is before you start looking at your reservoir um, chemistry and then the chemistry of those instruments and those manholes. Um, we did have an additional background well, but we had to throw the results out um, as the well was no longer being pumped and the well could not be adequately purged to grab a representative sample. So in my early days in the Corps, half my time was spent on dam safety and half my time was spent on hazardous waste cleanup. Ooh, I did not like it. But that hazardous waste cleanup sampling protocol came in handy when we started looking at uh, pulling samples for this. So you always want to have a representative sample. Um, so what we looked at, um, we looked at two different, uh, looked at the water in two different ways. We looked at stable isotopes of um, hydrogen and oxygen that are naturally occurring components of water in the hydrologic cycle. And we were looking at the ratios between um, deuterium H2 and H and oxygen and um, oxygen 18, I'm sorry, 18 and 16. Uh, and those change during evaporation and condensation cycles. So these ratios can also change during groundwater transport through mixing and dispersion with other water sources um, by equilibrium, um, equilibration and with oxygen-based ions. Uh, major ions and isotope ratios. So we also looked at the ionic um, chemistry as well. So those can help kind of provide a geochemical fingerprint uh, for groundwater and its recharge source. So during the sampling at Blakely, um, the following observations were recorded for P6. P6 went dry after purging about two gallons with the sample water being turbid with a strong sulfur odor. The way the guys um, talked to me about it, they said it looked like apple cider, but it didn't smell very good. Um, so what this plot is showing you is our isotopic ratios for each sampling point, including our background wells, uh, where are they? So our background wells are sitting right here, uh, clustered nicely on one end of our diagram. And then um, as well as our reservoir samples, which had a nice cluster. So we took reservoir samples in a couple locations. We took some just upstream of the dam. We took some over, um, there's a, where the spillway four bay is um, as well. And we did a couple, they took samples at a couple different elevations. Um, so um, the geochemist, the chemistry guy was really excited when he sent me this play. He's like, we had great like uh, separation between the source water. And I was like, awesome. I don't know what that means yet, but that sounds good to me. Um, so most of the piezometer and manhole uh, samples were a mix of both sources, uh, but were closer to the background wells um, than the reservoir, which is a bit of a surprise. Um, this includes P6. Uh, P1 is an exception. P1 is actually, um, if, I'm, if memory serves, it's tipped in the upstream embankment fill. Um, and so that one was the closest to the reservoir samples. You can see that P1 is here. Um, but a lot of them were a mix, and like I said, more on the end of the background well chemistry. All right. So um, during the same week, and again, this was just a scheduling thing. It wasn't by plan. Um, we had a different team go out, and Amy was part of this group, to do slug testing. Um, so while the, while the guys were out sampling um, and collecting water samples for the geochem analysis, we were doing those slug tests. And it was kind of like a hopscotch game, like, like they work on them kind of interchangeably. Um, and it, that was not the plan, but I think it worked out well, and I would recommend it going forward, maybe. Um, depends. So a slug test is a simple field test used to determine hydraulic conductivity of the formation in the immediate vicinity of the monitoring well. And the test consists of measuring the recovery of head in the well after introducing a near instantaneous change in water uh, level in the well. The change in that water level can be um, then, uh, it, that can be generated by either um, rapidly introducing a known um, volume of water, a solid object, or slug. Um, or a change in the air pressure uh, pneumatic. So we did have a pneumatic slug testing uh, system that we brought out from Albuquerque District to do this. Um, so we did use um, both the pneumatic method um, as well as that rapid infiltration. And this isn't actually at Blakely. This is actually a great fine dam in Fort Worth District. We did something similar. So that's me trying to pour out of this graduated cylinder water as fast as I could down the hole, which of course it's spilling out all over the place. And Amy's looking at me like, quit messing it up, Susie. Um, we tested all the piezometers installed at the embankment foundation contact, the blanket drain, and one piezometer in the upstream shell. 
So testing on P3, P5, P7, and P9 could not be conducted um, as they were screened in very low permeability materials um, and the tests would take too long. Um, so we backed off of those. There was, we weren't concerned about those locations anyways. Um, and then Amy's not in here right now. No slugs were harmed uh, during this field work. Bad jokes, that's what I'm here for. So these are the results of our uh, May 2018 slug testing. So these are normalized displacement plots from the three piezometers that were installed at the um, core foundation interface and one piezometer in the drainage blanket. So the drainage blanket piezometer is this guy right here, P170. Um, these plots show how fast the water levels recovered from the induced displacement and provide a general sense of the hydraulic conductivity. As mentioned before, the slug testing was performed the same week as the geochem testing. So P2, 4, and 6 were tested before and after they were sampled. Um, before P2 was sampled, we attempted a slug test and the piezometer responded so slowly, so that's this guy here, so slowly um, that we actually um, terminated the test before it went back. Yeah, two minutes, thanks. Thanks, dear girl. Um, we attempted to test the piezometer again after it was sampled and it only took about a half an hour to recover. So we took a test before we tried to purge the water. Um, it was very slow. We pulled the water out, ran another test. It went much quicker. Similarly, P4 had a very slow recovery in the first test prior to sampling. Um, and that's indicated uh, for P4 by this blue line to really slow, wasn't gonna, wasn't gonna stop. Um, and then, uh, but then it was much more rapid after we did the, the purging and sampling for the geochem portion. Um, P6 had a slightly different recovery before and after it was sampled, but was generally too slow for both. Um, the main difference between the first two tests and the third was the first two tests were pneumatic rising head tests, and the third was a falling head test with water. Oops, yep. So the final plot is for a piezometer in the blanket drain, and this is just kind of to show you the, the variability and the permeability that we're, we're looking at. So you can see um, that it shows a very rapid recovery. So we and kind of had a little bit of an interesting wobble on the order of 10 seconds, indicating very high hydraulic conductivity. And we expected that in the blanket drain. So some interpretations from that initial uh, May 2018 sampling um, is we knew that we had some sediment that could be affecting those slug testing results from the camera surveys. So the response to displacement increased after the, the PZs were purged for water sampling. But this was not the plan. This is where uh, we got lucky. Um, and then water level in P6 uh, returned to pre-1980 um, flushing levels after it was pumped for the water sampling. So that purge water, as I mentioned, uh, was yellow and had a strong odor, suggesting that it may be stagnant or plugged. So uh, post-May, uh, June 2018 investigation conclusions and recommendations, we reconvened on the site. Um, we were always there on Halloween, don't ask me why, it just worked out that way. Um, and later in that year, we reviewed all the results of that first phase of field work. And given the obser observed responses in slug testing before and after water sampling, the team recommended cleaning and developing the instruments in slug testing again. So um, I was not in the field when they did that initial um, water sampling and slug testing, but I was talking to Amy Lefebvre on the phone the whole time, and she was kind of explaining to me what was going on. And we almost said it both at the same time. Do you think the instruments are plugged? And we actually um, determined that that was a likely thing. Um, so we wanted to do um, some more, so we wanted to do some cleaning and development, developing of the instruments and then test, do slug testing again. Um, the water sampling results were a little challenging to interpret with one sampling event. So you always wanna do seasonal sampling um, if possible. So we did uh, go ahead and scope another round of uh, sampling for that. And we also agreed that, um, as I mentioned, or, or didn't mention, but slug testing and water sampling should probably be done in separate field events next time. I think it was helpful that we ended up doing it the way we did, um, but again, that was not planned, but we didn't wanna have interference from those uh, necessarily the next time. So in 2019, we headed back out into the field. Um, we had a lot of discussions with people across the core uh, experts in drilling um, to talk about how we could clean those instruments. They had very small riser pipes, like I mentioned, about a half inch ID now that I'm thinking of it. Um, we had noted damage in the instruments from the camera surveys, uh, and we had this concern over an existing hydrofracture. 
and that precluded more energetic flushing means. We certainly weren't going to drop a garden hose down the thing again. Um, so we actually decided to um, back off of that cleaning um, operation, but we did do a second round of water sampling. Um, so comparison of your isotopic data between uh, May of 2018 and, and February of 19. Um, again, we had good um, uh, kind of showing where our surface water samples and our uh, those background wells were showing. Um, one thing to bear in mind that while we did the February sampling, it was raining. Again, another lucky thing. So I'm not saying you should plan your field work in the rain, but you might want to if you think that uh, surface infiltration of precipitation is a culprit. So reservoir samples were seasonally stable. Uh, that was one thing we wanted to take. take. Sometimes you'll see an, a turning over of water um, in a reservoir, depending on where it is. Um, so you can see those shifts in chemistry over seasons. Most PZs did plot still between the, res the mix, you know, it showed a mix between reservoir and background well samples. Um, so there was some degree of mixing. Um, Pesometers tipped in the upstream embankment and core material uh, did appear to be more influenced by the reservoir. Instruments at the toe of the dam um, were actually interpreted uh, to be representative of a more localized groundwater. And again, this is where that precip infiltration uh, became uh, helpful. So infiltration of that precipitation uh, from surface runoff into the fractured rock abutment. Remember, this rock is really messed up, really fractured. Um, and there was some lag, but it would eventually kind of move down in the abutment rock and into the drain. Um, so we were seeing um, a mix of, of three different sources, uh, surface water, groundwater, and then that precipitation related water. So another interesting thing, again, this is going into like doing your background research and rooting around in multiple locations for files. Um, I did find a 1978 USGS paper that was entitled The Water of Hot Springs National Park, Their Origin, uh, Nature and Origin. So this paper was actually really helpful in understanding what sort of hot and cold spring act activity could be expected at Blakely Mountain. So isotopically speaking, the samples we pulled from our background wells were very consistent. Um, so what I did is I overlaid our tiny, this is our tiny isotope map here, and this is where it was plotting um, in the paper in the area that we were working. So we felt that that gave us some confidence. Um, it was consistent with some previous analyses done by the USGS. So we did some additional slug testing. Um, after those uh, pesometers were sampled again, we did another round. Um, and so results for both the first and second round of slug testing showed that P2 uh, showed uh, a little more rapid response. So it got a little, we think it might've been a little bit more developed. Uh, P4 and P6 had similar results and were not affected um, by that second round of water sampling. Uh, for P6, the second round of testing was similar to um, the prior year, um, and the pesometer still had a very slow response, and there was still some variability in the rate of recovery, and one uh, notion that we had was that it could be an indicative of movement of material in the filter pack. Again, we were suspicious it was plugged. Um, and then also a change in shape for the displacement plots could be related to um, whether we used a pneumatic uh, test versus um, a falling head test and how that water may be moving in and out of the screen. Uh, so I won't go through this because I'm running out of time, but we did take an effort to compare what we saw in the slug testing against what in the design documentation um, we would expect um, in those particular materials. And I think the, um, the short note is that um, we didn't see anything that deviated from what we were expecting, with the exception of the high conductivities and uh, observed in that pervious fill and uh, gravel um, blanket drain at the toe. So our current, then we they kind of checked our hypotheses about P6 behavior again. Um, so we revisited these hypotheses and what we um, came to the conclusion was that our PZ screens were clogged and that um, we had inadvertently through our sampling process uh, unplugged P6 and that was verified in the next cycle of dewatering in that power tunnel where we did not get a response out of pesometer six, that connection um, was closed. Um, and also P4, I didn't talk a lot about P4, but P4 also did not respond. Um, another thing um, that we talked about was we constructed a sigma W model, similar to what Amy showed on Abiquiu to understand where we might have low stress zones 
um, at the foundation embankment contact. Um, these results were varied, but generally speaking, it would not take much additional pressure to induce hydrofracture. In fact, some discussions with one of our now retired senior geotechs, uh, Jeff Schaefer, who's one of our hydrofracture gurus, we got on the horn with him and talked to him about it, and he said, I don't think you even needed to flush that piezometer. You just needed to put water to the top of it, and you could have induced hydrofracture at that depth. So additional boot pressure is what we started calling it, or back pressure would even uh, be an even worse condition. Um, the team also concluded that the most likely orientation of the hydrofracture was along those small, ca small scale troughs in the foundation parallel to the axis of the dam, and, I, and those little mini troughs that I was pointing out in those early construction photos. Um, the team did not think the hydrofracture would extend from the upstream coarse random material that could kind of feed that fracture um, down to the downstream gravel drain. So we did think that we had a hydrofracture at the core embankment contact, I'm sorry, the core foundation contact, um, but that it was a localized feature and likely kind of shot towards that abutment. So when we induced that pressure, it made that connection towards the power tunnel as opposed to going upstream to downstream. So um, back to our failure mode. For failure mode six, the team defined the flaw as being along the closed piezometer system trench. And we did that because we had to figure out a way to get this hydrofracture um, from that upstream pervious material in the, in the upstream uh, random fill down to our gravel drain that was not filter compatible. Um, the flaw node had uh, considered that an increase in pool pressure would need to propagate that hydrofracture through the core downstream along that, about 35 feet along a piezometer line. And also, I think you can see it here, that piezometer line, you can see it running here. It's got a bit of a lift. So we not only had to fracture it this way, we might have had to overcome some, um, some slope as well. So we estimated as a team for this node that it was virtually impossible to unlikely and would be pool uh, independent, or pool dependent rather. Um, so the field investigation also helped inform other nodes, including initiation, progression, detection, and breach. And it also helped improve the team's understanding of the instrumentation data and improved our, our confidence in that data. Um, so some key takeaways. Um, the team was able to gather valuable data using non-invasive methods to better understand the unusual behavior shown by project piezometers and improve confidence in the data. Um, our non-invasive multi-phased field investigation was scoped to determine if our piezometers were functioning properly and if the piezometer data being collected was reliable. If the core had been hydrofractured or there was another explanation for the high water levels in P6. And also to collect data to better understand seepage through the foundation. And we may have inadvert inadvertently fixed the problem in P6 by pumping the water out for sampling. That said, there's still a defect there. But we do feel that when we, we didn't see that connection to the power tunnel anymore, perhaps just simply drawing that water out and letting it kind of come back to normal might have at least improved the condition. Um, and we did gut check that with Jeff Schaefer um, at the time. Um, and he didn't disagree with what, what we had come up with. Um, I'm also pleased to report I was at the, um, we have a geology, geotech, and materials community of practice meeting, and we had that in uh, Atlanta of this year, and I saw Ryan Reeves, who's the, I think he's still the DSPM in Vicksburg district, and uh, I'm always happy to see Ryan, he's a great guy, good geotech, great DSPM, and uh, he said, hey girl, you guys, this is the, this is one of the people that helped fix Blakely Mountain Dam, and I just laughed, I was like, it was all luck, man, but it was on a hunch that those instruments were not telling us what we thought it was, and so um, just, just again, a note to, um, when you're scrutinizing your instrumentation data, um, Take a close eye on it. If you can't explain what's going on, look deeper, look harder. Um, and then it takes a village, so I certainly can't take any all the credit for this. Um, this is just a short list of everybody uh, that supported um, the risk assessment. Shameless plug for Hot Springs if you haven't been there. It's a really cool town, a lot of history, some cool old bathhouses that are now microbreweries, so that's awesome. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Amy, did I miss anything or any thoughts from you, my other half of my geology brain? Any questions? They keep you awake after lunch? You guys are funny. You're like, not really. What you got, Damien? 
I know. I would expect so on our, our on our projects, this is pretty uh, unusual, right? To do geochemistry. Why? Why don't we do it more often? Is it just difficult to do? Is it not the right setup for um, groundwater? Why the heck don't we see them more often? Uh, I, I, that's a great question, Damien. I'm not 100% certain. Um, I think um, perhaps it's just not being familiar with the um, with how that's done. It's actually a pretty inexpensive uh, thing to do. Um, but I also think that you need to have the need to understand that change in water chemistry across your site. And oftentimes it's more obvious. It wasn't obvious to us um, at Blakely Mountain. Um, so I certainly encourage folks as you're embarking on your investigations um, to consider it, but it's not always going to be appropriate for your site. Um, but certainly encourage considering it. Um, and I'm not an expert at this. I did not like chemistry in college. I'm just being honest. Um, but I was exposed to it early on in my career, and I knew it might be a potential tool to uh, employ. Um, and it seemed like a good plan. Again, we didn't want to do an invasive investigation at Blakely. We were concerned that we had a very damaged embankment. Oh, yeah, that's me and Amy. That's us on the geologic bacon. We've got some other really funny pictures of those. We've got one of our one of our advisors, Andy Hill, and Amy was doing like a panorama of the geologic bacon, and Andy kept moving. So you see Andy like showing up in different places, and one of them is just like this. Like, what is going on here? Oh, anyways, it's pretty cool. It was a fun project. All right, thanks.